In our thermal and statistical physics class, we've been studying phase transitions, and in particular, we've been using calcium carbonate as a model system because it has two different uh, crystal structures for the same material that have well-characterized properties. Here we have the entropy per mole, the volume per mole, and who cares about beta at this point for this example, we don't need it. Uh, we've got these well-characterized properties uh, measured for each one of these two phases at standard temperature and pressure, 25 degrees Celsius, 298 Kelvin, and one bar of pressure, 10 to the fifth, uh, 10 to the fifth pascals of pressure. So what I'd like to do right now is figure out how we can use this knowledge to actually sketch a full phase diagram, or at least portions of a phase diagram, for this system where we have two different solid phases of calcium carbonate to worry about. And the starting point for that is going to be, once again, one of our results from class. In class, we found that if we stay at 25 degrees Celsius, uh, at standard temperature and pressure, the calcite is more stable. But as we increase the pressure, once we go up to 3.6 kilobars, 3.6 times 10 to the 8 pascals of pressure, once we pass that point, at that point, the aragonite becomes the more stable phase at higher and higher pressures. So I've kind of sketched that out in what's going to be a phase diagram over here. We have pressure on this axis and temperature on that axis. And I've sketched out that here's my point at 298 Kelvin, 3.6 kilobars, where my transition was. Essentially, in class, what we did was start way down here at standard temperature and pressure and just follow that line upward until we crossed a phase boundary and reached that phase boundary point that, that I just passed in the middle. That was how we thought about this in class. And I guess uh, when I say we passed a phase boundary, the key idea was the more stable case, the more stable state is the one that has the lower Gibbs free energy per mole at that temperature pressure combination. So all we have to do is extrapolate Gibbs free energies to get to where we're going. So we found that point in class using the Gibbs free energy of each of these two uh, phases, crystal structures of calcium carbonate. What I want to do now is figure out how we go from just a single point to being able actually to figure out uh, more about this. And I, there are things we could do, right? We could try to scale over the Gibbs free energy to a different temperature and then go up there until we hit the pressure, and then scale Gibbs free energy to a different temperature, and then go up until we hit the cross. But there's a cl more clever way of doing that, using what's called the Clausius-Clapeyron relation that tells us the slope of the phase boundary. So what we're going to do now is just really quickly derive the Clausius-Clapeyron relation so that we'll understand it, and then from that, uh, from having derived that, we'll then go further ahead and figure out how to sketch this, sketch the full phase diagram of this system. So, all right, clausius clapeyron what's the idea? Well, we want to follow some boundary on a phase diagram. We want to start at a point on the phase boundary and just follow the boundary. So, on a boundary, we've seen this before, on a phase boundary, the two Gibbs free energies must be equal. That's the whole point of a boundary between phases. Is we, that's where the two phases can coexist, equally stable. So the Gibbs free energy per mole for calcite has to equal the Gibbs free energy for aragonite. We, those two are equal at that point. In particular, that's how we found this point here. Well now, what do we do to extend this a little bit if I travel along a phase boundary, it must be that as I travel along that boundary, the change in GC, the Gibbs free energy for calcite, has to be the same as the change in GA, the Gibbs free energy for aragonite. So in other words, following the boundary, If we start it on the boundary and we follow it, we must have that dg for calcite equals dg for aragonite. And hey, the fun thing there is, 
dg is one of those things that we know a thermodynamic identity for. We know that dg for calcite equals, we have to be sure we use the right uh, thermodynamic identity for this potential, uh, it equals minus s dt, and this is s for calcite, minus s for calcite dt plus v for calcite dp plus mu dn, but we're not going to let n change. We're not going to change our amount of stuff. We're just going to change temperature and pressure. So I'm leaving that constant n constant. I'll leave that term out. So OK, that's my dgc. And that has to equal dg for aragonite along the same boundary. This is the important part. As I travel along the boundary, I'm going to be changing temperature and changing pressure. But it's the same dt and the same dp for each of these. So this is minus s aragonite dt plus v aragonite dp, and these two have to be equal. So we just set those equal and solve for the slope. We can do this pretty easily. If we set those equal, well, let's see, which one's going to be bigger? vc minus va is going to be positive. Um, so I'll go ahead and set it up that way. If I set these two equal and get the dps on the same side and the dts on the same side, I can write this as Vc minus Va dp equals, that's on the, I guess, top side, the left-hand side. So over here, it's going to be Sc minus Sa dt. That's my, that, that's my, uh, that, that, that's what I do when I solve, when I separate the variables there. And so finally, I can write this down to give myself a slope. I find that dp dt, the slope of the boundary, this is the rate of change of pressure with respect to temperature following a boundary, it was the assumption we used to derive this. So dp dt, dp dt equals sc minus sa over vc minus va. And that right there, by the way, is the clausius clapeyron relation. That's the relation right there. And we're going to use that for our case. In particular, we've got this point up here that is a point, and now we have an equation we can use to find the slope. We can even plug in for that right now. If I plug in the variables that I have, and I'm going to be a little clever since I can. In a previous example, we worked out how the entropy changed between standard temperature and pressure and our phase transition point up here at the 3.6 kilobars. That's these little notes in red that I put down underneath those two. So we're just going to use that. We're going to use those higher entropies because, hey, if we did all the work to find them, we may as well use it. When I do that, I can plug in my numbers. My difference in entropies up top, when I plug in that difference, delta S is, let's see, it looks like it's 4.7 joules per Kelvin per mole. And my difference in volumes, difference in volumes looks like it is 2.78, 2.78. Double check that that's what I have. Yeah. I'm at 2 sigma, 2.78 cubic centimeters per mole. I've got those things. Uh, if I take that if, if I take if I take that ratio work this out, what I end up finding here is to two significant figures that we're estimating as phase boundary here, so we don't expect it to be perfect. To two significant figures, what I find when I do this is, let's see, get the numbers right, 1.7 times 10 to the sixth. Units here are going to be pascals per Kelvin as it has to be to make this work, uh, pascals per Kelvin. Per Kelvin. Um, here I'm in kilobar versus temperature. I guess I could write, the, if I want to write this in terms of kilobar, I'll, uh, uh, kilobar versus Kelvin, I could write this as 17, uh, 17 bar per Kelvin, if you want to think of it that way. Or maybe to get something nice and in scale, 
on my graph, I could even write this as 1.7 kilobars per 100 Kelvin. And suddenly, at that point, I can start to sketch a boundary on here. 100 Kelvin is about a third of the way over here. Um, 1.7 kilobars is about halfway down. So, roughly speaking, and I don't know how far I can really trust this, but in, this is the direction I'd be going anyway. Something like this around that point, that's, the, that's my line that is my phase transition line. It is, uh, it's a point and a slope, so it's the equation for a line that does enough information to determine a line. And I'm not going to draw it all, and I could in principle just extend this off to infinity in each direction, but in my heart, I know that these quantities are going to shift a little bit along the way. I know that my entropy changed on the way up here. I know that, well, the volume hasn't been changing much. I found last time the volume changed by just 0.5% all the way up here. So volume change isn't a big deal. But the entropy change, there's going to be a change in the slope as I go along. It will, it will change. And especially as I go down to different temperatures, the entropy is going to change an awful lot. So what do I need to do to, I, I have a line. And at least near the point where I calculated it, that's going to be a pretty reliable line to work with. What you really want to do to do a full phase diagram is to have multiple points where you're doing this sort of thing, where multiple points where you're sketching out what is that slope going to be. And I want to point out another thing that we can do with this, uh, an, another thing that you can observe with the clausius clapeyron relation down here. I could choose another point. I could say, what will my slope be if I have a point on the phase boundary over here? Now you're saying, wait a minute, this line seems to come down and hit down here. It's not on the phase boundary at all. But I, I happen to have seen some examples of this when you actually do the corrections carefully, where I expect to hit somewhere over on this side. I expect this slope to, to, to this, this line to curve down and you know, curve along and come over to this line somewhere so that cal so calcite will be the stable phase all the way down to zero temperature uh, at whatever low pressures here. So I expect there to be some minimum pressure where aragonite can happen, just from other experience. So what do I do with that? Well, what can I say? Let's just imagine that there was a point, say, here, wound up being a point that the transition point at temperature equals zero, the transition pressure at temperature equals zero. It's, it's somewhere over there. I don't know exactly where, but it's going to be somewhere over there. What will the slope be of this at that point? Well, we can be a little sneaky there. Anytime we're at t equals zero, like I am for that particular example, at t equals zero, we know by some law of thermodynamics, third law of thermodynamics, uh, we know that the entropy of anything equals zero. And that means that the numerator of the clausius clapeyron relation is zero. So dp dt will always equal zero at the left edge of a phase diagram. It will always equal zero at that point. So wherever this dot is on the left, I know that near that, I'm going to have a basically horizontal dp dt. So then if I wanted to draw the full phase diagram at this point, I take points that I know, and I just connect them. I'll just do a little sketch to connect the two with the slopes that I know. And so it's going to look something like Something like that, probably, is the phase diagram that I expect for the calcite-aragonite phase transition of calcium carbonate. And the details of where exactly this point is, all that kind of stuff, I think ends up being a sort of messier calculation to work out because the entropy changes. So obviously, the entropy goes down to zero when you get to the side of the graph. And so, but actually, that's already an argument for it, right? That at any given point, as the entropies approach zero, that numerator is going to go towards zero. And so the slope is going to flatten out. We expect as we go to the left on this graph that the slope will flatten out eventually and eventually just flatten completely. So that's why I expect it hit on the side here. I don't know where on the side, but I expect it to hit on the side. This is what we do 
to construct a phase diagram for something like this, for any phase diagram really. What we do, we identify a point where the, that's on the phase boundary, and then we find the slope using clausius clapeyron And then if we can find that for multiple points, we can then connect that, we can just sketch connecting those points together and get a phase diagram put together. If there are more phases than this, then we would just do slopes for multiple different phases, phase boundaries, and figure out which, uh, which phase was preferred on each side of each line, and it would give us a more complicated but more interesting diagram. That's about that. It's how you find, how you find the shape of a phase diagram as you work through your, uh, your calculations of Gibbs free energies and other properties of materials.